All right, Amy, is it okay if I go ahead and kick us off officially? I'm ready. All right, cool. Good afternoon, everyone, if you are on the East Coast, and good morning if you are on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for being here for today's Bloomerang webinar, Three Secrets to Raising Major Gifts That You Cannot Survive Without. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Just want to let you all know that we are recording this presentation. And if you uh, perhaps have to leave early or want to review the content, you'll receive that recording from me a little later on this afternoon. So have no fear about leaving if you need to. Uh, you'll get all those goodies from me a little bit uh, after we conclude here today. And as you're listening today, please feel free to use that chat box. I know a lot of you already have. That's awesome. We love to keep these. Uh, webinar is interactive, and we're going to save some time at the end for Q&A. So don't be shy about sending your questions and comments our way. Uh, we're going to try to answer just as many as, of those as we can before the 2 o'clock Eastern hour. And if you're a Twitter person, you can follow along on Twitter as well. Send us your tweets. Use the hashtag Bloomerang, and our username is at Bloomerang Tech. And just one final reminder, these webinars are usually only as good as your own Internet connection. So if you're listening via your computer speakers and if you have any trouble or perhaps lose audio at any time, uh, try dialing in by phone. The phone quality we have found is usually a little bit better than listening via your computer. So if you have a phone handy and you don't mind doing that, uh, just use the phone number in the email from ReadyTalk that went out uh, just about an hour ago uh, today. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, I want to say an extra special hello to you folks. We do these webinars just about every Thursday. Uh, we have a great speaker on who gives a, a really fantastic educational uh, presentation. We've got lots of webinars scheduled throughout the rest of the year. Uh, but if you're unknown to, to Bloomerang, if you don't know about us, we offer uh, donor management software. And if you're interested in that or perhaps want to check out our offerings, you can go to our website. You can even download a quick video demo and get a glimpse of the software. You don't even have to talk to a salesperson if you don't want to. So I'd love for you to check that out if you are interested. But for now, I'm super excited to welcome back one of our favorites. Uh, Amy Eisenstein has been on our webinar series, I think, every year since we uh, initiated it. So I always look forward to January because that means we have Amy with us. Hey, Amy, how's it going? Hey, Stephen. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me back. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't dream of, of not having you. Um, if you guys don't know Amy, I just want to brag on her a little bit. She really is one of our favorites. She is our go-to expert for all things major gifts. So if you are interested in major gifts, she is the first name that you should look up on Google for sure. Uh, she's an author, a speaker, a trainer, and a consultant. You can find her uh, keynoting several major conferences every year. In fact, she was telling me about her busy travel schedule a little earlier on today. She is an AFP certified master trainer. She has her ACFRE designation. Not a lot of people have that. I think only about 100 people in the world have that. It's a big deal. She is the author of three really awesome books, one of them uh, specifically about raising major gifts for small shops. And she's also the co author of, I think, the definitive major gift fundraising study that was completed in 2015, Mastering Major Gifts. I think she's going to tell you a little bit about that today. You've got to download that survey, that study. Um, it is the best, I think, scientific research that exists today on major gift fundraising. And Bloomerang was a, 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 played a small role in sponsoring that. Um, but Amy was kind of the mastermind there. So Amy, I'm going to pipe down. I've already taken up way too much of your time to tell us all about major gifts. So take it away, my friend. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, Stephen. It's always a pleasure to partner with Bloomerang, and you really downplayed your role in this research study that I'll tell folks briefly about, um, which we couldn't have done it without you. So anyways, but today we're going to talk about three secrets to raising major gifts that you can't survive without. I've called it developing more than friends and followers, but let's dive right in. So I have this um, slide about me, which you don't need to see. Uh, I've worked in fundraising for a long time, basically. But the research project that Stephen referenced, which Bloomerang was a major sponsor of, um, was called Major Gifts for Small Shops. Um, and we did research on how small and mid-sized organizations raise major gifts. And the research results can be found at masteringmajorgifts.com. So if you want to grab that, 
um, research study. We have both the executive summary and the full research project that will come your way. So basically, I just want to start out, when you learn to raise major gifts in a real way, you will get freedom from sprinting from one grant deadline to the next and one event to the next. You're going to become an expert in the field and an in-demand fundraising professional. To me, this is one of the most important things. I know a lot of consultants who constantly are doing searches for development directors, and there's a real shortage of people with serious major gift skills in the field. Um, and so they're the highest paid professionals in our field, and they're the most in-demand. So if you are a competent and successful major gift fundraiser, um, your career is going to really take off. So um, when you learn to raise major gifts, you really overcome your fear of raising gifts and any fear that you have of asking. And I know it sounds crazy to say that development directors or people in our field are afraid of asking, but it is really common. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's just something to say, hey, you know, it makes me a little queasy in the stomach, and I need to figure out how to get past this and get the confidence that I need and the skills that I need so that I can ask without fear and with confidence and raise more major gifts. So I want you to think about for a minute, you know, just what your life would be like um, if you're able to surpass your fundraising goals by 10%, 50%, or even 100%, because that really is what major gifts is all about. Um, and hopefully you'll never have to stress about deadlines related to grant writing and events. That's the beauty also of major gifts. Um, you'll overcome your fear of asking. Like I said, you'll be qualified for any job in the philanthropic sector, and you have donors who will make a real difference to your uh, mission and your nonprofit, and that's the goal. So I just wanted to give you three quick examples of case studies of organizations we've worked with. Cynthia was at a small community theater. Um, after a few tips, honestly, she re asked for and received her, her first gift of $10,000 that she had ever asked for and the theater's first gift. And she's gone on to ask for several more. And what a difference it made in the experience that that theater had. Um, Hillary, raising money for children with disabilities, raised two $50,000 gifts after some of these tips um, in one year. And prior to that, her largest gift had been 20000 So that was amazing. And Sue, at a mentoring program, um, is raising major gifts for the first time from every board member. So just really cool examples. So I want to just preface this. Results are not typical. I'm going to walk you through the secrets, but I want to say that our um, our results aren't typical only because the average person who attends any training gets zero results because they don't apply what's in the training. So I really hope that you'll take notes, take two or three key takeaways, and change what you're doing starting next week um, or tomorrow so that you can really raise major gifts for your nonprofit. You deserve it. Your mission and your cause deserves it. So okay, enough of that. We're going to get into it. Here are the secrets. Number one, your best prospective donors are hiding in plain sight. Secret number two, if you get a meeting, you're going to get a gift. And secret number three, your board is focused on the wrong metric. But when you focus on the right metrics, your results are going to skyrocket. So that is what we're going to cover today. So secret number one, most development directors uh, that I interact with, that I talk to, in the field, they don't think they have any good prospects. But your best prospects, your best prospective major gift donors are truly hiding in plain sight. And I do get calls all the time from folks uh, looking, wanting new donors. They'll call me and say, Amy, can you help us find new donors? And that really, those aren't your best donors. And I'm sure that you've heard Stephen and the folks at Bloomerang talk about retention, donor retention, being so much more important than um, acquisition, than finding new donors. But it's even more true in major gift fundraising. So it's important to start with some of the donors that you have. So focus on major donors. 
really you only need a few major donors to raise significantly more money than you are right now. And I think that one of the reasons that major gift fundraising is so intimidating because it seems like so much work, it is a lot of work, but um, I think that really you only need a few to make a huge difference in your bottom line. So that's what I want you to focus on. Stop trying to focus on hundreds of donors and focus on four, five, ten people at a time. So you've probably heard this before, but if not, you can make more money from your top 10% of donors than with the other 90% combined. Now you may have heard this um, as the Pareto Principle, and basically it's the 80-20 rule. You've heard that that 20% of your donors give 80% of your dollars. But with lots of campaigns, annual or capital, but certainly with a lot of major gifts programs, this is even more true. So 10% uh, of your donors might be giving 90% of your dollars. And so I want you to think about it and figure out what it is at your organization so that you know that you should be spending the vast majority of your time focused on that top 10% of donors. And I'll also say that one major donor can increase your fundraising revenue by 10% or more with one gift. So I want you to think about it. Let's, we just finished year-end giving, right? So at year-end, I don't know how much you brought in. Maybe $100,000 was your goal at year-end. Maybe a million dollars was your goal. Um, but if your goal at year-end for that campaign was $100,000, then one $10,000 gift gets you an additional 10%. If your goal was a million dollars, one $100,000 gift gets you to 10% or more. And you know that's of your whole campaign. That might be hundreds of donors made up that whole campaign, and yet one, two, or three donors can totally uh, radically change what you, what you raise. So if this is true for one donor, I want you to just imagine what would happen if you have five or even 10 major donors. So um, like I said, we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. We want you to, I really want you to focus, depending on what your role is at the organization, if you're a development director doing everything, if you're the executive director, um, I want you to focus on a few key people at a time as opposed to having a huge list. And that's some of the important takeaways that we got out of the research project, actually, that Stephen and I were talking about earlier. Um, is to focus on some of your key people as opposed to focusing on a huge list, which is a mistake that we see in nonprofits all the time. Now that being said, if you are a full-time major gift officer and your primary responsibility is for raising major gifts, then of course you'll have a bigger list. Um, but I'm guessing that most of you on the call have multiple responsibilities and wear multiple hats at your organization. So I'm going to argue for the sake of today that you don't need new donors. You don't need any new donors to get started because your best prospective donors are already in your database. Um, so if you're using Bloomerang, hopefully you know how to access that, them. If you're not using Bloomerang, hopefully you also know how to access them. But regardless, if you don't know how to bring up some of your best donors, which are your biggest donors, your most loyal donors, your repeat donors over the years, um, then Bloomerang will for sure help you figure that out. But um, let's talk about ABCs of donor identification, your best prospective donor identification. So A stands for access. That means who do you have access to? Um, this is just an acronym for helping you remember and figure out who are your best major gift prospects. So those people that you have already have access to. And those are people in your database, probably people you know or people who have given to your organization. B, of course, is for belief, those who believe in your cause or your mission. And C, for capacity, comes last. That is, do they have the ability to make a major gift at whatever a major gift level is at your organization? It might be 5,000, it might be 10,000, it might be 50,000, it might be 100,000, but that actually is the last thing I want you to think about um, because
frequently when I am in a board training, I facilitate a lot of board trainings, the board members and even the staff sometimes think about this backwards. And so the first question that I'll see board members or even development staff members ask themselves is who do we know that's rich, right? Who do we know that's wealthy? And or, or who is wealthy? I shouldn't even say who do we know because access is the key. So then names come up like Oprah Winfrey and, and Bill Gates, right? And people will be like, oh, yeah, they would be great because they're so wealthy. But we don't have access to them, and they don't believe in the cause. So it really doesn't matter how wealthy they are. They're not great prospects for um, for our nonprofit. And so first we need to look in our database because those are the people we have access to. And in theory, if they've given a gift, they already believe at least a little bit in the cause. And then we can figure out, do they have the capacity to make a major gift? So that's how we're going to, to approach them first. Um, okay. I also want to say it's really important to ask for more because most people aren't giving you nearly as much as they could. It's, uh, I want you to think about it. So a great example is um, at the year end, right? We just got through year end, and I'm sure you got dozens or maybe more solicitations from all sorts of various nonprofits. Now, I send in to lots and lots of nonprofits, $50, $100, just because I like them, I like their mission, they're good organizations, and I want to support them. But if, but $100 isn't nearly what I could give if I was solicited, encouraged, motivated, educated more about the organization. If anybody came and sat down with me and said, here are the reasons that we're going to ask you for $1,000, it wouldn't really be a stretch for me to do that. Now, that's 10 times more than I'm giving to most nonprofits that send me a solicitation in the mail. So I just want you to think about your own giving um, because most people aren't really that different. They're, with their first solicitation, whether it's to your event or for direct mail or email or whatever it is, in, until you sit down and have a conversation with them, they probably are not giving you what they could. So key, key, ask for more. Okay, on to secret number two. If you get a meeting, you'll get a gift. Now, I know that that's a tall order, and um, you might be like, all right, Amy, what are you talking about here? I've had plenty of meetings. I didn't get a gift. But stick with me for a minute. Let's see. So first is get out from behind your desk. Too many development directors get stuck at their desk. And I think that um, this is a real key that successful major gift officers know, that 70 to 80% of their time is spent out meeting with donors. The money is out there. It's not in here. You are never going to get a major gift from your desk, or very rarely. And so I think it's really important to remember that even though the grants are piling up and the event is coming, those are deadline-driven fundraising events, you're never going to raise major gifts unless you get out there and meet with people. So what is your goal to get out there and meet with donors? Are you meeting with donors once a week? Are you meeting with them twice a month, three times a week? What is your goal to sit down and have a conversation with a donor in their home or office? Okay, so meetings are pretty powerful. To me, if you get someone to take the time to meet with you, they're much more likely to get to make a gift. Now, there's a couple of um, things I'd like to say about that. So one is frequently people ask me, do you tell people the truth about why you're coming to talk to them? Right? And I would definitely say yes. Obviously, we are building relationships with, with our donors, with these folks, and so the goal is to get them, if they agree to a meeting and they know what we're coming to talk to them about, then the likelihood increases significantly 
that if we get someone to meet with us, they're going to make a gift. I'll say more about that in a minute because I know you might be skeptical. But if you, if you don't tell somebody when you're coming to certainly ask them for a major gift, this is a, more of an initial meeting, but when you're asking them for a major gift, if they have no idea what you're talking about or why you're coming to meet them, what is the chance that they will actually give you a major gift? I want them thinking about what they want to do before I get there so that we can have a thoughtful and meaningful and realistic conversation. I don't want them being shocked by the topic of conversation because if they're shocked, there's really almost no chance. So if they know what the topic of conversation is and they agree to meet with you, you're significantly more likely to get a gift. The reality is you don't want to waste your time or theirs meeting with people that don't have any interest in giving you a gift of any kind. So first, the don'ts of first meeting. So this is not when you're asking for a gift. This is when you're getting to know somebody. Um, this is the initial meeting. Whether it's a board member who you know actually pretty well or someone who you don't know well, you still need to have sort of a first pre-ask meeting. Because even though you've seen your board member every month or quarter for years at a board meeting, you still want to talk to them, sit down, and, and talk about how it's going, how their experience has been, what they'd like to see happen with the organization. You can't do that at a board meeting. You need to sit down. So first meetings, um, I would say do not offer to give them an update about the program. Do not offer to thank them in person, and do not offer to tell them about your organization. Now, this may come as a shock, but and, you're, and lots of people, that is the go-to thing. You call up, I actually had um, a woman call me a couple of weeks ago, and she said, Amy, I'm really having a hard time getting meetings with people. Nobody will meet with me. So I said, okay, tell me a little bit about what you say. Tell, pretend I'm somebody that you want to meet with. You're going to call me. And so, she said, okay, I call, I say, hi, I'm calling from this college, and the dean or provost, whoever it was, I can't remember, um, would like to come tell you about all the exciting things that are going on on campus. And that's what she was saying to people to try and get them to meet with her and this dean. And I thought, oh, well, okay, it's so obvious to me why people aren't meeting with you. That's so boring. Just send them an update. You can, um, make, if they care about what's going on on campus or what's new, then they're reading your newsletter, they're on your website. Um, but that's boring to people. And why are they going to waste their time when they're busy, they have lots of other responsibilities and other things to do, let this dean come sit in their living room or in their office for 30 minutes and tell them about what's going on on campus when they can look at the website or look at the newsletter in five minutes. So you know what's the number one thing that people love to talk about. I don't even need to say it. You're all saying it in your heads. It's themselves, right? That's the number one pe thing that people like to talk about. So by you going to them and saying, I want to talk to you about the organization, that's boring. What they really want to do is talk about themselves. Um, I'll tell you another quick story, and that is when, you know, when I first started fundraising, I – thought my job, I really thought my job was to go out and tell people all about this battered women's shelter I was working for. I thought that that was my job, that my job was to educate people all about the battered women's shelter. And I would go around and I would talk for an hour, as you can tell. I am a chatterbox and I can easily talk for an hour, but what do you think the person across from me was doing? They were so bored. It was such a snooze fest because even though I was telling stories and statistics and telling all sorts of interesting things about this battered women's shelter, really I wasn't engaging them in conversation. And that's what, what you want to do to get people to meet with you and in a first meeting. So the do's of a first meeting. If you're having trouble getting a first meeting with someone, have a connection, make an introduction. So if you want to meet with someone but either they're not responding to you or you think they won't respond to you, see if there's a board member or a volunteer at your organization who knows that person who can say, okay, please meet with this person from XYZ organization. Second, when you call them up or send them an email, you want to 
tell them you'd like to meet to ask their advice and opinions, right? That goes back to the heart of people love to talk about themselves. So if you say, listen, I'd love to come get your perspective on how we're doing as an organization, I'd love to come ask your advice about where we're going with programs and services or a campaign. Um, ask their, people love to be asked advice, right? It's very flattering. It's very honoring. So you want to discuss their goals and passions. So tell me, you know, why did you decide to get involved with this organization in the first place? Can you tell me a little bit about what drew you to us? Why did you give the first time and why do you continue to give? Why do you think this organization is important? You can ask their advice on how are we perceived in the community as a community leader. Uh, what should we be doing differently to get the word out? Um, what, you know, whatever advice you need. But of course, you want it to be genuine and authentic and real. You're not making up um, nonsense to ask them about. This is really important stuff. You need donor feedback in order to improve. Right? So, you know, why do you as a donor give to us? What should we be doing better? Um, what's your donor experience like with us? And how can we improve that? So you also want to keep it short and convenient. So let people know, listen, this doesn't have to be over lunch. This doesn't have to um, take an hour. It can be 20 minutes, 30 minutes. We just, I'd like to sit down and ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to make it as convenient as possible. You don't have to schlep to our organization. I'm happy to come to you and meet with you in your home or office. So really working to get a first meeting. So during the meeting, ask open-ended questions. I went through a lot of them to learn about their interests and motivations. Why do you give to charity? Why do you think people give to charity? What makes you decide to give to one charity over another? Um, so of course you're going to answer their questions and provide brief updates about the organization. And of course, I, on my do not, what not to do slide is tell them that you're going to come thank them. But if they're a donor, of course you're going to thank them. But that's not enough of a reason for them to meet with you. That's sort of the bottom line is that you know, if you say, I'd like to come thank you in person, they can say, no, um, that's OK. I got your thank you note. You just thanked me. Please don't come thank me in person. So, um, and, and the same thing. You're not going to tell them you want to come give them updates about the organization. But you can, you can ask during the meeting um, what area of our organization is of most interest to you or what program or service are you most interested in that. And tell them a little bit about that. Or even ask them, what do you know about our programs and services? And do you have any questions? So you can provide very brief up updates. And then, of course, you want to engage them. So invite them to take a tour or volunteer or get more engaged. Now, of course, sometimes you might get bad advice during um, your meeting. You might get feedback that doesn't align with your organization. So let's say you're asking advice. I have development directors who are sometimes like, I don't want to ask my donor's advice. What if I hate their advice or it's bad advice or we're not going to do it? So. I'll never forget I had this coaching client and she, she was asking for marketing advice and from a donor who was in marketing and he wanted her to put up billboards all over the city, which was of course very, very expensive but also just not what they were planning to do. And so he was like, oh, let's design billboards. It's going to be so exciting. And um, she's like, oh my God how do I get out of this because my biggest donor now is telling me to put billboards up all over the city. What am I going to do? And so I think always, always, you want to tell them that you'll think about it. First of all, buy yourself some time. So just say, that's an interesting idea. I hadn't thought about billboards all over the city. I need to talk about it with the rest of the team, and I'm going to get back to you. And so just sort of validate their idea, acknowledge it, and then within a week, follow up. So call them back. Say, hey, listen, I was really thinking about that idea for billboards all over the city. Um, I discussed it with the board, key board members, the leadership team, and unfortunately it's not in the strategic plan for the next three to five years. It's not something we're going to do. But um, 
you know, can we discuss these other ideas or what else have you got type of thing. And so you're following up, you're acknowledging their idea. You need to be careful because they might offer to pay for it. It's possible that that big donor would have said, oh, well, I'll fund all these billboards. But you still need to be able to come back with confidence and say, listen, we've really decided to go in a different direction, and we hope that you'll help with funding you know, X, Y, or Z. And so, but buy yourself some time by just saying, that's so interesting. I need to think about it. I need to toss that around. You know, it's not just up to me. I need to discuss it with the team. I need some time to think about it in the context of what else we're doing, and I will follow up with you, and then do follow up. Okay, so then, of course, you know, the, the secret number two was if you get a meeting, you'll get a, you'll get a gift. And so, of course, you have to ask. So not at the first meeting, but you need to transition to the ask. You need to move that relationship to an ask meeting. So taking the relationship to the next level, asking for deeper engagement, that's volunteerism, taking a tour, joining a committee, whatever it is. Um, and then asking for a gift, because of course if you don't ask for the gift, you won't get the gift, um, not in most cases anyways. And so, so getting that first meeting does lead to a gift most of the time. It doesn't mean you'll get every gift you ask for. It doesn't mean that you'll always 100% of the time get a gift. And it doesn't mean that you'll get exactly what you were hoping for, but the chances once you get a meeting, once you are able to sit down with the person, if you, you can say to them, listen, um, especially on the first meeting, when they have an objection on the phone, they don't want to meet. They say, listen, I am not going to ask you for money at this meeting, but I do want to explore ways that you will support, that you might be interested in supporting the organization um, in bigger ways. And so you're telling them, I'm not going to ask for a gift this time, but I'm not taking it off the table for the future. And that way they know that it's on the table and that's part of the discussion. And then the people that really are not going to give or give more will just not meet with you. And that's fine. That saves you time and trouble and it saves them time and trouble. So, okay, moving on to secret number three. So your board is focused on the wrong metric. And once you focus on the right metrics, um, your results are going to skyrocket, hopefully. So what you measure improves. And you know this from lots of examples in life. Um, when you eat, when you count calories, you eat less calories. I have my Fitbit on today. I'm not doing that well, but I'm counting steps, so I'm aware of it. And so I'm going to make an extra effort to take more steps today and exercise more because I'm paying attention. So really, really, truly what you measure improves. And you can ma um, raise more major gifts, I'm going to argue, by simply changing what you measure. I also want to say that it's not just about dollars raised because that is the number one metric that everybody measures. And of course you're going to, going to measure dollars raised, but I don't want that to be the number one thing or certainly the only thing that you focus on because it really can be a false indicator of success. Let me give you a quick example. So let's say your major gift goal, if you're just getting started, is $100,000. And you raise in the first year, because you're really good at what you do, uh, 10 gifts of $10,000 each. So 10 gifts at $10,000, you raised $100,000, your board is thrilled with you, your executive director thinks you're a fundraising genius, and you've raised $100,000. Well, the very next year, nine of your donors do not make major gifts again, but one of them actually bumps their gift up to $100,000. Now, if you're just reporting on major gifts raised, you are going to be able to report that you raised $100,000 in major gifts again in year two, same as year one. But if you're not paying attention to who's giving and how many people are giving and gift size and repeat donors and retention, then you're not going to be paying attention to the fact that nine out of your 10 major gift donors left 
and nobody on your board knows that your major gift program is headed towards, you know, down the drain, as opposed to they think everything's fine because you're just focused on dollars raised. So we have to measure lots of things, and we have to focus on lots of different metrics. So some of the metrics to focus on is repeat gifts. So returning donors, we have to look at this. The, um, retention rates are all the rage this, uh, for the past few years. Um, the folks at Bloomerang talk about them with good reason, and hopefully you are paying very close attention to retention, returning donors, and repeat gifts, and, but even more so with your major donors. So if you have hundreds or thousands of donors in your database, who are your major gift donors, and how are you going to track that retention rate, which should actually be significantly higher than your overall retention rate uh, for your annual fund program. We really want to keep our, especially our major gift donors. So we need to pay attention. Are our major gift donors giving us gifts year after year, or are they leaving, and are we scrambling for new major gift donors every year? So an increase in gift size, of course, will tell us that our major gift program, whether it's growing or not. So are we able to move some of these major gift donors up the ladder? Our $1,000 donors, are we moving them up to $2,500 or $5,000 or $10,000? Our $10,000 donors, are we moving? Are, have they been giving $10,000 for 10 years in a row, or are we able to move them up? And measuring stewardship efforts. So that is the thank you and follow-up. And I think this actually is measured um, the least well, if you will. But this actually plays a role in whether or not your retention rates are good, whether your donors come back. So I want you to start paying attention to, for each major donor that you have, how many times and in what ways are you saying thank you and how are you communicating how that gift was used and the importance of that gift? Because it doesn't really matter if, well, it doesn't really matter what I was going to say was, it doesn't really matter if your donor, if you thank your donors, it only matters if your donors feel thanked, right? Think about the distinction there. I have lots of organizations that tell me, oh, we sent our donors thank you letters. Okay. Do your donors feel thanked? So what are you going to do differently? Um, is the message going to come from a variety of people in a variety of formats? You're going to send an email. You're going to make a thank you call. You're going to sit down and thank them in person. Um, a board member is going to do a thank you. Uh, the executive director is going to do a thank you. So these are for your major gift donors. So how are you stewarding your major gift donors? and so that you're sure that they're going to come back for the following year. And do they know how their gift was used and the impact that it had? And so that they feel that they want to do that again. How are you going to measure that? So a few more metrics to measure. So meaningful visits. So this is about getting out of the office and sitting down in front of your donors. And so when I was at one organization, there were a lot of development directors, and we got sort of scored or judged on our visits. And so lots of people tried to get around this in the system, and they were able to because they would say, oh, well, I bumped into so-and-so on campus, or I bumped into them at an event the university was hosting, or I bumped into them at the gala, and I'm going to put down that I had a two-minute talk with them, that I had a conversation with them. Well, that's not what I'm talking about for a meaningful visit. A meaningful visit is when you schedule a time to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a small group conversation in their home or office, maybe at your office or in a coffee shop if you need to, but you know, when it's a planned meet meeting so that they know that they've met with you. It's not just that you bumped into them at your gala or at an event. Um, I want you to measure the number of asks made and the number of gifts received. So this is really, really important, and I don't think a lot of organizations do this. Because if you are asking 
10 times a year for a major gift, and you're getting um, zero of those gifts, we know there's a problem, right? You're not um, doing enough cultivation. You're not identifying your prospects well. Um, if you are measuring the number of asks you make and the number of gifts you receive, and you are making a fair amount of asks or whatever number of asks, and you're, you're getting very few gifts, we can say, okay, hold on, there's a problem here. Maybe you're asking prematurely. Maybe there's an issue. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're asking 10 times a year for 10 major gifts and you get all 10, you might say, hey, I'm doing great, but I would say, you know what, I don't think you're being aggressive enough. I think you're waiting so long until you're 100% sure that that person is going to say yes, and I want you to be a little more aggressive. So I actually want you to... Um, get between 50 and 80 percent of the asks um, that you make or the gifts, uh, the gifts that you ask for, right? And the same thing with dollars raised. So I only have right on here number of asks made and gifts received, but also I would measure amount of asks made, uh, not the number of asks made, but the amount of, of dollars that you've asked for over the course of the year. So let's say um, you ask 10 people for $10,000 each, you've asked for $100,000, and I want to know how many of those $100,000 that you've asked for you've actually gotten. So if you've gotten $80,000 out of the $100,000 you've asked for, I would say good job. You were a little aggressive on the ask side. I want you to be, um, but you did get the vast majority of what you asked for, so great job. Um, if you're asking for $100,000 and getting $100,000, I would say you should have been more aggressive. You should have asked for more. So we don't know this unless we pay attention to this. This is why the metrics are so important. And of course I have dollars raised on here, of course, because you have to pay attention to that. That's the bottom line. That's what your board's interested in. But to me, there's so many other indicators and metrics which are going to tell me that your major gift program is growing or shrinking, and it just is not about dollars raised. So as a reward sort of for sticking with me on this uh, potentially long and boring uh, webinar, as webinars tend to be sometimes, I'm going to give you my free metrics worksheet on how to evaluate your major gift program. So it's at masteringmajorgifts.com slash reward, and you will get um, all of the metrics that I like to look at and the bottom you'll see is a little survey to send your donors as well. So um, that, that is there for you for the taking. So let me just ask you a question, chat in. Are you enjoying the webinar? Are you ready to raise major gifts? Awesome. Hopefully we've, we're going to, yay, we're getting some yays. Okay, so hopefully, oh, we've got lots of hands raised. That's so exciting. All right, awesome. We're ready to raise major gifts. So, we are just about ready for questions, um, so I want you to start typing in your questions, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit of, about an opportunity that I've put together that I'm really, really excited about. So uh, send your questions to Stephen in the chat box, and I'll just tell you about um, what we've covered and a little opportunity that I have for you, and then we'll get back right into questions. So what we've covered so far, secret number one, your best prospects are hiding in plain sight. And I know it sounds obvious, but too many people call me and tell me we need new donors. We don't have any donors. And it's simply not true. You've got to start with the ones that you have. Secret number two, if you get a meeting, you'll get a gift. And secret number three, focus on the right metrics. So hopefully uh, we fulfilled all of those promises today. So I just want to tell you a little bit about a course that I've put together that is a result of the research project that Stephen brought up at the beginning of the call that I'm so proud of and so honored to bring you. So I've put together this seven-week online course, Mastering Major Gifts, and it's about increasing fundraising revenue by 10, 50 percent or more at your organization. Like I said, it's about getting off the never-ending treadmill of grant, of grant and event deadlines. It's about career advancement, becoming an in-demand fundraising professional, and it's really about overcoming the fear of raising major gifts and raising significantly more funding in less than one year. So that's sort of why I put together this course. 
And I just want to tell you a little bit about it. It's seven weeks of videos. Um, the topics are introduction to major gifts, uh, how to determine what a major gift is at your organization, how to build your case for support. It's about working with board members and getting them on board and engaged and in the process of raising major gifts and what to do with board members who won't. It's about identifying your best prospects. We talked a little bit about it here, but we go into a lot of detail about how to put together your portfolio or pipeline of major gift donors. It's about creating cultivation plans for each of those donors, solicitation scripts, role play, the who, what, when, where, how much of asking. It's about stewardship and follow-up, capital campaigns, and staying on track and time management, which is such an important part of raising major gifts, especially in a small shop. And the course has been awarded 35 hours of CFRE credits. There's live Q&A sessions with me to answer your questions, worksheets, checklists, private Facebook community, 200 wealth screening of your donors, an hour free tech consult thanks to Bloomerang. Um, a capital campaign readiness assessment, and bonus materials. So I'm so proud of this course that we put together. And it's about to start on February 7th, and it'll last for seven weeks. And you can take it from your home or office, on your computer, on any device, on your iPad, on your phone. Um, and if you miss a week, it's no big deal because you can just go back and listen to the materials. So you can find all the details at masteringmajorgifts.com slash join. So anyways, I know it's a lot of money. It's almost $2,000, but one major gift covers the cost of the investment. So I hope you'll check it out. I hope you'll consider it. Um, and you know, it's your two choices. Are you going to do what you've always done to raise major gifts, or are you going to do something really amazing and different this year? I'm getting amazing feedback from the course. So that's the pitch as fast as I could. And now, Stephen, we are at our question time. Awesome. Great. We've got probably about maybe 12 or 13 minutes for, for, for questions. Uh, but do check out that course. Um, obviously, Amy is super smart from what you've heard over the last hour. So definitely worth the investment. I would encourage you all to check that out. And download the study there on MasteringMajorGifts.com as well. Really good information. Really, really cool data if you're into some, some nerdy stats like I am. Um, but Amy, we've got a lot of questions, probably way more than we can get to, but I'll try to roll through them as quick as I can. Um, okay. The number one question, you will probably not be surprised to hear that, is how do you define the dollar amount of a major gift? Because it, it, yeah. it seems like it, there's, it's kind of a balancing act, right? Because you want to define it for your organization, but you also want to stay donor-centric and, and let the donor kind of decide you know, what was a major gift to them. So how do, you, yeah. how do you kind of balance that, that line and, yeah. and decide for yourself? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, are you looking at it from the organization perspective or are you looking at it from the donor perspective? Because the organization might define a major gift one way, um, and yet to an individual donor, uh, $1,000 might be a huge gift to me, and somebody else, mm -hmm. that's not a big gift at all. It might be 100000 yep. where they start to think about it as a major gift. So I would say that, you know, obviously I go into lots of detail in the course about how to define a major gift at your organization and why it's important. I mean, it's important for a lot of reasons, for recognition purposes. So who's going to get a plaque on the wall? What kind of recognition are you going to do? Which is why you need to know what is a major gift at your organization. But I think even more importantly, you need to know what a major gift is so that you spend your time wisely. Is it worth yep. it for you to go out and sit down with a donor if you're asking for $1,000? Some of you are nodding, mm -hmm. yes, it is worth my time to do that. Others of you are thinking, no way, I would never spend my time you know, sitting down with a donor and only asking them for $1,000 because we raise more than that. So it really depends on who's on your board, what type of gifts you raise, who's in your database. But I'll just say this, you know, when I worked at the Battered Women's Shelter, uh, $5,000 was a huge gift for us. We didn't get that kind, of, that kind of gift from individuals very often. It was a huge, huge major gift for us. Um, and then I went to work at Rutgers University where more than 10 years ago they considered $25,000 a major gift. 
and right down the road from us at the same time was Princeton University, and they didn't start talking about major gifts until 100,000 or more. I'm sure it's a million mm -hmm. today, but um, so it really <laughs> depends on your organization, but, but you have to know what it is for, for a wide variety of reasons that I've started to mention. Makes sense. Amy, you, you laid out sort of the, the process, but a couple of people were wondering how long does the whole process you know, take? Should they be expecting this to last you know, weeks, months, is it, is it even days? You know, what, what's kind of the spacing between all these, the, all these meetings and touches? Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to depend on how engaged the donor already is. And so I would say that if you're just getting started raising major gifts, then um, these are, gifts are for your annual fund. Hopefully you're not in a capital campaign yet, although I'm sure some people on, on the call are. So this is not a multi-year ask for the most part, and it shouldn't take longer than a year. It should take less than a year because you need it for your annual fund. Um, you're boosting your annual fund. And these are people, you're starting with your best prospects in your database, and so they're already donors, and they know you need the money. So I would say, you know, on average, between the first, and set, the first meeting, a first meeting, even with this, if it's with a board member, somebody you know well, to start to discuss a gift and an ask, should be, you know, two weeks to three months. Because you don't want it to drag on much longer than three months unless this is a person who really needs cultivation. They haven't been on a tour. They haven't met your clients. They don't know much about your organization. Then it will take a lot longer than three months. But if you're working with an existing donor, um, you need to have one, maybe two meetings before you sit down and ask with them. Uh, ask them. So it could happen over a couple of weeks or, or a couple of months, depending on everybody's schedule. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Amy, along those same lines, uh, Diane, Diane here was wondering, what about when you are returning to a previous major gift donor? Should you space those out? Is there a time that maybe is, is too soon to go back and ask for another major gift? You know, should right. you give it a year? Should you wait until yeah. the next major campaign? What about repeat major donors? So I would say that on average, you probably want to ask for a major gift on an annual basis if you're not in a campaign. Okay. So if it's not a multi-year ask, in general, you want to ask uh, once a year. But if you have good reason to ask more frequently or you think your donor is open to it, like let's say you have an emergency or an amazing new program or project, and you say, hey, listen, I know we already asked you for this big gift six months ago or three months ago. Um, this issue has come up, whether it's an, a good thing or a bad thing, emergency or new opportunity. Say, and, you know, I was wondering if you'd be open to the conversation uh, to give more this year. And, and, you know, see what they say. It's up to the donor. Love it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, Amy, we've got a lot of really good questions here. I'm going to try to get to maybe two or three more. Um, Vicki here was wondering if, if you think this whole process and philosophy also translates to granting organizations. I know, you know grants isn't necessarily your, your you know, main focus, but you know, does, does these things kind of apply to, to granting organizations, you know, the in-person meetings and you know, the, maybe the asking for advice doesn't translate as much, but um, yeah. What about those grantors? Yeah, I mean, I do think that you should treat grantors more like individuals. I mean, I think that the organizations that just write a grant report and communicate just by email or through grant application and don't actually know any of the human beings behind the funding mechanism um, are much less likely to to do well in their applications. You know, the people making the decisions at foundations and in corporations are human beings. And so if you take the time to build relationships with them and sit down and have conversations with them, A, you'll be much more prepared in terms of preparing your application because you'll have asked them some important questions. What are their priorities? How much should you ask for? Um, those types of questions. And I just think you'll be much more likely to get a grant if you do 
um, treat those people at the foundations as individuals. Makes sense. Um, Amy, we've had a lot of people ask about sort of plan giving and multi-year pledges. Uh, okay. And any thoughts on those things and how those things may sort of insert them, themselves into the process here? Yeah, so I think that initially as you and your donors are getting accustomed to doing um, sit-down discussion meetings and asking for major gifts, it's probably not the first thing or the first ask out of the gate for a planned gift or a multi-year gift, mm -hmm. but certainly those are wonderful things for nonprofits to be able to raise. Uh, Multi-year gifts are great because you don't have to go back to the donors every year. So if you can sit down with someone and say, usually it's reserved for more of, more of a campaign type setting than an annual fund, but if you say, um, we'd like to ask you to consider a gift of, of $25,000 over five years, so $5,000 a year, um, that's wonderful because then you can feel, you still have to cultivate them and steward them, but um, you've done the ask. And so if they sign a gift agreement, then you can be pretty confident that most of that money is going to come in. In terms of planned gifts, yeah, I mean, if you can start raising planned gifts at your organization, whether it's bequests, which are really the most popular type of planned gift. They're like, I think bequests, the last statistic I saw was like 90% of planned gifts are bequests. Yeah. So if you're not doing planned gifts, um, you should start there. Just asking people, say, hey, listen, have you thought about um, leaving money in your will, right? How are you going to leave a legacy? Have you thought about the legacy you want to leave? And starting to have those conversations. I would start in your boardroom, starting to have those conversations, and then just simply advertising in your newsletter and on your website that you do accept bequests. If you want to do more sophisticated types of planned gift, gifts, you might partner up with um, you know, a professional in the, in the area. You don't necessarily need to be an expert in all types of planned gifts because they're not going to come so frequently at the beginning. So you just need to have mm -hmm. a resource partner that can help with those types of things. Um, so hopefully Makes I sense. answered that question. But we do, I do actually have modules and, and sections about planned gifts and campaigns in the course. So if anybody wants a lot more details, hopefully they will, they will consider that. I thought you might, might have that covered in your, <laughs> your awesome course. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Amy, we're about out of time. Maybe we can add, maybe we can add on or end on one last question. You know, we have a lot of small shops listening today, a lot of brand new organizations who maybe don't have a lot of current donors. What's what's your one piece of advice for those those new folks and, and those smaller shops? You know, should it be is it board members? Is it friends and family? What's yeah, one thing they should do today to get started? Yeah, I would say that it's board and friends and family. So. One of the things that I do at a lot of board retreats that I facilitate is I do an exercise with board members. Because if you say to board members, who do you know, or who do you know that's rich, or who do you know that we can ask money from, you know, you're going to get crickets. Nobody in the boardroom is going to say anything or, t you know, <laughs> nobody wants to volunteer up their friends like that. And so it is really tough and intimidating sometimes for organizations to start getting names. So I'll do an exercise. I give out a piece of paper. There's a circle in the center. And then if you can uh, picture spokes off the, like a bicycle wheel, right? Spokes off the center circle um, to, an out, to outside. And I'll just tell board members, okay, put yourself in the middle. Well, first I start with an exercise where I say, okay, the organization's in the middle. Who do we know as big groups as the organization? We know donors, we know board members, we know vendors, we know service providers, we know um, clients. And so each spoke at the end of the wheel will have a group of people that the organization knows. And then the exercise continues. They put themselves in the middle, fill in you in the middle. So who do you know at the end of each spoke? Um, friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, you know, whatever. So you have 10 or 12 categories of groups of people that they know. So then we do the ABC with them. The uh, A, you have access to all of these people. B, who of these people do you think 
believe in the cause or could believe once we introduce it to them and see who might have the capacity to give a major gift as we define it at our organization, so $1,000 or $5,000. So I want you to write down one name at the end of each spoke, so one person in your friend category that you might um, introduce to the organization that you have access to because they're your friend, they might believe in the organization, and they might be able to you know, give a gift close to that size. And so instead of asking your board members for all their connections to download their whole smartphone contact list into your database, you just say, look, I want you to start with five or ten people around the spokes in your wheel. Um, and it's a good exercise to do with your staff and board members to start them thinking about who's going to take a tour, who's going to come to events, who are you going to start to cultivate. So hopefully that helps. Awesome. I love it. Amy, this was, this was fantastic. Thanks so much for spending an hour with us today and sharing all your knowledge. This was great. Well, thanks for having, having me. Stephen, if you want to send me some of those questions we didn't cover, I can try and yeah. do a blog post or an article for Bloomerang if you want me to answer a few more of the questions. Absolutely. I know we didn't get to a lot of them, so I will send you those questions for sure. And, and I would encourage all of you to, to go to Amy's website, read her blog, definitely read her blog, really good content, follow her on Twitter. Obviously, she knows what she's talking about. So conversation doesn't have to end here today by, by any means. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> well, cool. Thanks to all of you for uh, hanging out with us as well. Um, I know you're, you're all very busy, so I always appreciate you all joining us uh, every Thursday here. Uh, we've got a great webinar coming up one week from today. In fact, all of them are great. There are, we've got a few uh, scheduled out into, I'd say, the next maybe seven or eight Thursdays. But one week from today, we're going to be talking about capital campaigns. So it's early on in the year. Maybe you're just starting to plan a capital campaign. Don't miss it. It's going to be a great one. Um, if you're not into capital campaigns at the moment, you know, check out our webinar page. You may find another topic there that interests you. We look to see you here in another Thursday webinar. So we'll end it there. Uh, look for an email from me with the recording later on this afternoon. And, uh, and email me if you don't get that for any reason. No problem. I'll, I'll get that to you. Uh, no matter what. But we'll call it a day there. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Have a great weekend. And hopefully we'll talk to you again next week. Bye now. Thank you.